following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. Welcome, you're joining us on a special presentation here on Other There on a 24. Now, tonight's topic is something that I'm sure with the current climate of the country as well, is something that everybody has been discussing in their social circles and their personal circles at home as well, and that is on immigration. Now, migration as well. Now, this is a topic that is not new to any of us. We've all seen, we probably have multiple members of our family that have already gone through such a process as well. But certain intricacies, certain nuances of this entire topic still remains unclear to this day. And to speak a little bit about this process in detail to help you get through with whatever aspirations you have in another country, we have Mr. Sanju Jaising, who is the principal solicitor of Oxbridge Associates. Now, uh, thank you very much, Sanj, for taking the time to speak to us, uh, to our audience, and to enlighten our audience on this topic. It, it really means a lot. Thank you, Anuradhi and Darren, for having me. It's a pleasure Great. to be here. Well, uh, just to give you a little bit of an introduction on our esteemed guest here, Sanj is actually an Australian qualified solicitor admitted to the Supreme Court of New South Wales and the High Court of Australia and of course Oxbridge Associates is not uh, it's not just a recently established firm it's something with a lot of practice as well uh, Sanchi himself has experience of 25 years practicing in law in Australia and is a registered migration agent for 10 years so safe to say we're in good hands when it comes to this uh, discussion as well well, uh, before we get into any of the specifics, Sanj, I feel like our audience would very much like to know a little bit about the already existing pathways. We've seen it everywhere. We have billboards, we have advertisements online, you know, you can go to Australia, simple as that. So could you explain to us what exactly are the current pathways that exist and like the processes in which you can migrate to a country like Australia? Thank you, Anurad. Yes, of course. Uh, I think if I were to break it down into three main parts, as to how to get to Australia. I think one segment would be to go there as to study in Australia. So studying part is one component. Then we move into the middle part, which is you would commonly known as the skill migration part. So Australian government would consider this as studying in Australia and then bringing your family into Australia. And third most important part is investing in Australia or doing business in Australia. Now, that third component that I just mentioned is not so much to, talked about in general public. Uh, and that's a very interesting area to talk about as well, same as the middle part, which is uh, skilled migration program, bringing your family, partner visas, and all of that. So essentially, if I had to bring it down into three basic areas, I would say studying in Australia, bringing your family into Australia, or doing business in Australia. And on top of that, what you need to understand is why the Australian migration program exists in the first place. Not many applicants or agents don't understand the context behind it. Now, Australian migration system demand, it is based on a demand and a supply issue. Australia being a young country with a very small population, roughly almost equal populations in Australia and Sri Lanka, about 22 million each on each country. Australia is about 121 times bigger than Sri Lanka with a very strong economy. But we do have a small issue, that issue being we have what is called an aging population. Now, when you have an aging population in a country, naturally, that country wants the best talent globally to migrate to that country. And that's why you have seen these programs over the years, skill migration program, student programs, as well as investor or global talent program, where if you are a talented person in any country, there's a separate pathway for you to apply. So that's just a general introduction from me. But always remember, a lot of the time, people are talking about the most common criteria, skill migration, or mm -hmm. subclasses 189, subclass 190, or 482, 485s, and all of that. But it's important to understand that there are at least 60 categories that one can actually go to Australia. And that's not often stated everywhere at least 60 subclass categories that one can be in Australia. Right, so there are multiple means in which you can enter Australia, but I'm sure a lot of us would have heard mainly about the student application process, I believe. And of course, that 
do you believe that it is much more popular in comparison to the other forms of migration that we have into Australia? Yes, yes, uh, without a doubt. Student migration has been very uh, aggressive over the last few years and that if you take 10 years backwards to what the Australian government's policy is, uh, about 2013, 2019, there has been massive reform into the migration law. And that law identified the next 10 year plan for the country, which encourage more students studying in Australian universities. And that's worked brilliantly well. Uh, I myself is a lecturer who teach uh, at few universities. Number of overseas students that I have seen over the years is just tremendous. And that's attracting more money and pumping the economy over there a lot. Uh, but while we're on the same topic, it's, it's important when you study as a student in Australia to understand uh, whether that investment, that significant investment uh, from a Sri Lankan point of view, whether it'll have any return in the future as well. Uh, if I may just elaborate it a little bit as Please. to what I said. When you want to become a student in an Australian institute, most of the time when you talk to these students, they want to be, they, they should have a longer term vision, be part of Australia, sub, uh, apply through the skilled migration program, uh, or to do further studies. Uh, but it's, it's absolutely important to understand if that is your goal, you must qualify for an Australian study requirement condition. Now that's a clause or a term that is not heavily discussed or debated. Uh, now I don't know why. Uh, and it, it is a tragedy sometimes we get applicants. Now we as a practice generally don't do student migration matters or student visas because we focus on other areas. But sometimes when things don't work out, we often get these inquiries from students. And it's very sad to see that a student has completed a degree program in Sri Lanka or in Malaysia through an Australian university. At the completion of that program, a student does not qualify for the Australian study requirement. And that's mainly because there's a requirement for that student to be studying in Australia physically. Uh, and if that hasn't taken place, all that money, all that time that you spent on is somewhat wasted in a way. Uh, so does that mean that already existing pathways, they do not really advertise that there is such concern when considering, because we've seen a lot of people that go through a tertiary country in order to get to Australia as an end goal. And uh, right now, Sanj, you just told me some groundbreaking information, which is you could potentially not qualify in that long-term goal as well. Absolutely. Because, I mean, you, you asked the question, why do you want an Australian qualification in the first instance? Yeah. Uh, Australian qualification will give you two opportunities. One thing, or rather three opportunities. One thing, you will have an Australian qualification. And if you're happy with that, that's fine. Second avenue might be, you probably want to get that extra five points through the skilled migration program. Because if you do have an Australian qualification, yes, the government will actually give you that five extra points for studying in Australia, which will boost your 65 points when you apply through the skilled migration. There's a third aspect. As an Australian student, you are entitled to enter into a special visa called temporary graduate visa, which means if you had studied in an Australian course, a recognized course, it could benefit you by having another 12 to 18 months to work in Australia, or sorry, 18 to 24 months to work in Australia. And that would give you a significant advantage to you as an applicant, either working there locally or to come back to your country with an Australian experience of two years. But you, are, you will not be entitled to that qualification or that entitlement, that visa category, if you haven't satisfied the Australian study requirement. Right, so you could not even place on the starting line if in case you don't look through the clauses and make a very careful decision, especially regarding the entire future uh, that you've decided upon with one educational institution. Absolutely. Now, I feel like when coming into education, one of the biggest concerns that parents or students or maybe skilled workers trying to emigrate to Australia uh, see, and that is the English language requirement and English language proficiency. Could you please run us through the process? Is there an absolute necessity? Is there a hard line standard that that Sri Lankan uh, uh, hopefuls should be achieving in order to uh, qualify? Yes. Uh, there's no easy answer to that, to be honest, because every course will dictate what is the minimum ILTS or PTE entrance requirement. But the basic answer to that question is, yes, there is an English language requirement 
for you to conduct studies over there. Uh, is, there is an English language requirement for you to apply for permanent residency through subclass 189 or subclass 190, skill migration category. Uh, but having said that, uh, there are special categories that you could ask the department to waive that English language requirement altogether. Now, for example, we do a fair bit of what is called the global talent visas. Now, in global talent visa, uh, or distinguished talent visa, yes, there is a requirement for the applicant to be waived that English language requirement. Uh, so what is important to understand is where do you want to go? Uh, and then is this investment worth making to get to that point? Right. I believe we had a perfectly good introduction into this discussion. We have a lot more to discuss as well in relation to migration and Australia specifically because it is one of our key countries that we have seen exchanges with over the past few years, especially when it comes to students and also skilled workers. Well, we, before we get into any of the other discussions that we have planned for tonight, we'll go in for a short commercial break. You're watching Special Presentation. Be right back. All right, sir. That was the first three questions. Welcome back. You're watching the special presentation on Other Verona 24. And tonight we're talking about one of the most prevalent topics right now in our social spheres, and that is on immigration, specifically on Australia, because it's one of our most key nations in which we see uh, such a process in which so many individuals want to actually end up in Australia. Now, Sanj Vijay Singh, her principal solicitor of Oxbridge Associates, sir, you've been uh, explaining to us exactly how. Uh, to go about this process as well and the key introductions, the foundations we just laid. Now I believe it's good for us to get into the practical aspects. When it comes to the application process, I believe it is completely convoluted, the information you have online, on the internet. Some, educa some educational institutions might tell you to go a certain way and then there are other immigration agencies or migration agencies that say, no, that is completely wrong. You must go this way in order to achieve uh, a perfect migration process. So could you please uh, explain to us, walk us through the common errors that you frequently observe uh, under Oxbridge uh, where migration has turned into a complete flop of a procedure. Could you tell us about the application procedures? Thank you. Yes, thanks, Anuradhi. Uh, I must start this with the following comment, that migration law is one of the most complex laws in Australia. Uh, some say it's only second to tax. Some say it's actually tax is second to migration law. Uh, yes, there is a lot of information available to everybody on the websites and uh, other migration agents or lawyers often publish things on website and YouTube clips and all of that. But it's a very complex system. Uh, and it is important that when you submit your application, number one error that we have seen for your application to be rejected is that you haven't submitted the right document in the right manner and the form. And that's a very uh, big step for your application to move into the next steps. In every application, uh, there are primary criteria that the applicant must establish. Uh, some of those primary criteria could be uh, applicants' health requirements, applicants' uh, criminal checks, uh, applicants' documents in place, which is a, a very interesting criteria called 4020, public interest criteria, where the applicants have submitted bogus documents or incorrect documents, either on purpose or without their knowledge. Uh, all these criteria must always be satisfied. So there's a primary criteria, there's a secondary criteria that must be satisfied. When you prepare your application, if you do not address each of these criteria, and these are very comprehensive criteria, there's a high chance of your application getting refused. Uh, and the second aspect I've seen is not understanding what avenues is, are available to you once your application is re refused. Now, yes, it is migration law, but at the same time, this administrative law coming into place, and you will appreciate this uh, as Definitely. someone who is learned and uh, reading law. Administrative law is the part that governs the administrative appeals tribunals and the court system. So we at Oxbridge, we have done more court work over the last 15 years, me as an advocate over the last 15 years, and even at Oxbridge, uh, a very young practice, five years now. But we had almost every step of the way administrative appeals tribunal matters. Federal Circuit Court matters, 
full court, Federal Court of Australia, as well as High Court leave applications. So there is an avenue available. But what is important to understand, anything after the Administrative Appeals Tribunal are appeal on the basis on the error of law. So you cannot argue the facts. And you would appreciate now how important to introduce the right facts at the basic level, which is your application level. You may have a secondary chance at the AAT hearing, but anything after that, it's purely on the appeal, is based on the error of law. Strictly legislative. Absolutely. So my advice is that please visit the right people before you lodge your application. Yes, it may, be, it may look simple if you go to the department's website, yes, it has some criteria, but if you are lodging a complex application, if you have been rejected in the past, chances are you're going to need some serious amount of assistance. Right, and I believe uh, our population, our audience, will be very glad that Oxbridge Associates is also planning to launch their operations here as well and have already started, so I, safe to say we're in good hands, I believe. Thank such. you kindly. Well, um, now moving on to another question, which is now, okay, the application process is very convoluted. Sanj, how could we effectively maximize the potential for us or the points of our application or visa application? How can we maximize our probability of being selected? All right. Uh, that's a very good question. I think the best, and there are different answers for every different application. Now, if I were to uh, talk about student applications, as an example, uh, is, are you a genuine student? That's the number one question the department wants to know. And as part of that, you must prove through a statement that you genuinely intend to study in Australia for the purpose of studying. And if you don't establish that assessment criteria, your application will be refused. And a lot of students go through that all the time. They change their courses halfway through, which is a very common thing to happen. But even if you do change your courses halfway through, you still must convince the department that you are a genuine student. Give you a real life example, perhaps. A hairdresser from Sri Lanka who's been a hairdresser for three years applies to become a, or to study to something to do with commercial cookery. Now chances are that application is going to be rejected because there's no link between that person's prior history to what they want to do. Having said that, have you crafted your application properly with the proper genuine study statement? Yes, that gap can be reduced to convince the department, yes, I was a hairdresser, it didn't work out for me, and therefore I like to explore other opportunities. And that's one of the primary criteria that I've seen that where student applications are denied. Uh, of course, there's the common one being not having the sufficient financial background or not being able to show the finances as the department would require. But one of the ma major concerns, for, especially for Sri Lankan applicants over the last 18 months with the economic crisis in here, has been extremely difficult. Right. That's one. Second part, if you talk about, uh, you talked about the migration point system, so that is naturally talking about the skilled migration system where an applicant must get 65 minimum points and five points are awarded to Australian qualification, some points for age and all of that. Once again, make sure that you submit your application at the right age bracket. Uh, once again, make sure that you maximize your chances through ILTS or PT exams, because that's important. Uh, there are other tips that we can give uh, to how to maximize uh, your prospects in getting the maximum 65 points. There's community language requirement that not many people are not even aware of, which could easily get five points. Uh, there's other visa categories, for example, uh, 482 visas for an employer to sponsor you to have you uh, working uh, in Australia. Now, a lot of Sri Lankan nurses and doctors are looking into this category or and have looked into this category over the last 12 months with us as well. Uh, so it's all about going to the right place. Uh, exactly, and figuring out the right visa for you as well, especially considering how vibrant it is, our population that are planning to go into Australia as well. Now, before we conclude on this discussion, I feel believe we're running out of time. Uh, could you please let us know? I feel like this is the key question. You just touched on it as well, Sanj. Rejection. Now, your visa has been rejected or refused. What does one do in such an instance? Because we're lost after that. All we see on the internet and all we see in uh, modern media is how to apply and on the assumption that you will get your application accepted. What do you do when it's rejected? Good question. 
Uh, this doesn't apply to all the visa categories, but most of the visa categories, there is an appealable or a review process. If your visa is refused, especially as a student, as a partner visa, uh, or a few other categories, but not tourist, uh, you could actually ask the department to review it. And that review is not through the department, it's through a different body altogether called the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And that tribunal, a tribunal member, will look at the facts once again, assess the scenario and make a decision. And the tribunal does have the power to overturn the minister's decision. Ministerial decisions are on one side, tribunal decisions are on the other side. You could still get the matter refused at the tribunal as well, and you might want to know what happens then. Then there is another appeal process to the Federal Circuit Court of Australia. Yes, if you get a good outcome, wonderful, you go back to the tribunal uh, to make any changes, but if you fail at the Federal Circuit Court, then yes, there is another avenue. You could appeal to the federal, full Federal Court of Australia. You might ask the question, what happens if you lose at the full Federal Court? Right. Technically, there is one avenue, High Court of Australia, but very rarely uh, that I would even recommend anyone to appeal the matter to the High Court because that's strictly on the law itself as an extremely difficult avenue. And even if uh, before you get to the High Court, you must pass the High Court leave application in the first instance. All that application process could take up to four to five to six years even, all the way to the Federal Court of Australia. Last year, we concluded a matter uh, for one of our very important clients. Eventually, he got the visa, uh, a very good outcome, but this amount of stress amount of uh, money in terms of the fees and all of that is quite important to understand all of that. So my advice would be, if there is another pathway, if your visa is rejected, but I will always encourage people not to make, make sure at the very beginning you submit the right documents in the right fashion. Right, always have preventative requirements or preventative measures in order to have the best possible outcome. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have tonight to speak about this very important and pertinent topic. Uh, Sanju Jisenga, the Principal Solicitor, Fox Fox Associates, thank you very much for enlightening our audience. I believe we just uh, we're going to go back uh, to our lives with some key pieces of information that we have not seen in the current uh, media sphere as well in relation to migration. Even though there's a lot of buzz and talk around it, I believe today we touched on points that was not quite discussed in uh, common public spaces. So thank you very much, Sanj, for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you, Anuradhi, and thank you, Darren, for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for you tonight. If you had missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. This was a special presentation. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Have a great night.